Hi, I'm Art Bergeron. Uh, welcome to the fourth of 12 seminars, which I've ge uh, gene generically called Elder Law 101. Uh, this is all about taxes. Don't be taxed by taxes. Uh, this is part of a 12-part series um, that I've developed to really summarize everything that you as a senior or your kids need to know about Elder Law. We've already talked about, um, uh, about my friends Frank and Mary, about thinking about estate planning before your 60s. Then we talked about uh, issues in, in, important to you in your 60s. Then we talked about issues important to you in your 70s. That was January, February, March. This month, because everybody thinks about taxes, it's April, I decided that I would do one of the two presentations dealing with a, a specific topic, which is taxes. Next month, I'll be talking about a life in, living life in your 80s, uh, then wh why you can always qualify for mass health, then the last year of your life, which is gonna happen. It may be happening to you right now, but it's gonna happen. Then what happens after you die? Kind of a post-mortem, talking about probate, other things. Uh, then, then trust administration, because so many of you have trusts. The question is what happens to those trusts after you die? Then talking about estate planning, uh, what do you, how dealing with your kids in, in particular and your grandkids. Um, then we're gonna have the two, two more of these specific specialized presentations. We're gonna talk about Medicare in November when, when all of you should be thinking about Medicare. We're gonna be talking about gifting uh, and, tax plan and other tax planning issues that you think should be, you should be dealing with now, but you really were supposed to have dealt with back in December. So we're gonna talk about all those things. So we're always talking about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, their goal in life is very simple. They wanna live in their house until they die. They wanna be buried in the backyard. They wanna leave everything to their kids. Uh, when they were younger, they wanted to make sure that they also avoided um, probate. That may still be important, but they definitely want to avoid taxes. Nobody comes into my office that doesn't say that, that part of their plan is they want to avoid paying taxes. <clears throat> so today is just about taxes. Now I always talk about Frank and Mary, but uh, in this series I've also introduced uh, Mary's sister Peg and her daughter Peggy a single person and her, and her individual daughter. In this case, Peg and Peggy are worried about exactly the same things that Mary is worried about and that Frank's worried about. Um, so I'm using two different examples um, when I talk about these issues because as many of you know, I, I work primarily in two different areas. I work out here in Metro West where I live, which is in Marlboro. So I live, I work, do a lot of work in the boroughs and in Hudson and, and, and uh, Hopkinton Ashland, these communities. Um, I also do a lot of work on the islands, on uh, Martha's Vineyard uh, and Nantucket. For those of you who don't live there, you don't realize that whenever I'm on one of those islands, I always have to refer to the other island as the other island. A lot of those people don't really like each other. Um, but the point is, they have a different situation. Or if, if I'm talking to you right now, you have a different situation because of your house. So in, in my example, Frank, um, Frank and Mary own a house and out here in Metro West, it's worth $400,000 and out on the islands, it's worth a million dollars. Same house, same house, worth about a million dollars or more. Uh, uh, Frank, the, other, the other numbers though are the same. Frank's IRA, Frank has an IRA, it's worth about 400,000. They have joint savings worth 300,000. They have some mutual funds worth 400,000. So out in Metro West, that adds up to an estate of about a million five. On, on the islands, that adds up, adds up to a state of about $2.1 million. So we're gonna talk about um, the, the, these, the set of tax issues and how they affect these, may affect these players differently, but conceptually, the issues are the same. Uh, I'm gonna start off by talking about capital gains. We're gonna talk today about a set of different taxes. And by the way, I tried consciously to keep the numbers on these slides to a minimum because when I'm talking about taxes in general, and, and, and more specifically when I start talking about the numbers, people's eyes glaze over and they're like, oh, this is way over my head. So I want you to get, the point of this presentation is to conceptually get how these issues are connected. I realize your situation is unique. Everybody's situation is unique. And the way these numbers would affect you, therefore, is unique to you. All I'm suggesting here is there are some things that you want to be talking to your accountant about or your lawyer about to figure out your goal. And the goal is, all, is not to, 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 to minimize a particular tax. 
The goal is to minimize your total tax. Does you no good if you've minimized the estate tax and as a result of that you're paying a boatload more in capital gains tax. The question is kind of what's the net? And, and you want somebody who really likes math and who does this stuff and who is, re who is consciously aware of, especially on the federal level, the changing rates of taxation um, in order to help you figure this stuff out. So <clears throat> first, we're talking about um, two kinds of federal uh, income tax. One is the regular straight income tax and the other is the capital gains tax. And actually this tax is both federal and state. Capital gains tax is the tax that you pay, to, very simply, if you bought something for a little bit and you sell it for a lot. The difference between what you bought it for and what you sell it for is if you're selling it more than a year after you bought it is a capital gain. There is a tax on that capital gain at the federal level that tax is, is around $15,000. I'm going to once again kind of keep this rounded so that we can keep the numbers simple. The state capital gains tax is a, is a flat rate and it's around 5%. Um, so the total tax, the total capital gains tax for purposes of this presentation, we're going to talk about as being 20%. What is, how do you compute the capital gains tax? Well, first, by figuring out the capital gain. What is capital gain? Capital gain is adjusted sales price minus basis. Adjusted sales price, well you know what sales price means, it's the amount that you sell it for. The, it's the, 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 for purposes of capital gains ta tax though, the issue is adjusted sales price. That is the sales price minus like the real estate commission, minus your, your real estate lawyer's fees, minus any work that you had to have done on the house in order to get the house ready for sale, minus all the things basically that it costs you uh, in order to get that house um, ready for sale. So, so that's pretty obvious. The next question is, what is basis? Basis is a made-up term, right? It is, it is only relevant. I mean, you thought you knew what, what the word basis was. It has nothing to do with this. This is simply a word that was made up in the Internal Revenue Code and then, and then in the Massachusetts Code. All other codes have adopted it. <clears throat> so the question is, what does it mean? Well, it means it's something very straightforward. It means... Uh, if you bought the property that you're about to sell, it means your purchase price might or plus the cost of the improvements. What, are, what can I take as improvements in, if for, for purposes of doing this adjustment? Talk to your accountant as to whether or not replacing the roof is, a, is really an improvement um, um, as opposed to painting the house, as opposed to, I mean, there are a million things that you can think about in the house and say to yourself, so what, you know, what, what, what are those improvements? And by the way, the next question is, if I'm about to sell that house, how do I figure out the price of those improvements? Um, if you worked on the house, no matter how much your sweat equity, it counts for zero in terms of doing the improvements. If you paid somebody to do the work, or, you, or if you, were, you, paid somebody for, or you paid for supplies or whatever, all of those are part of the improvements. But once again, you wanna to talk to your accountant about this. By the way, one other thing, when you're going to sell your house, oftentimes you'll talk to your accountant and say, well, how do I prove what those improvements were? And, the, and, and you think, because you're thinking you're going to need to file all of that when you file your income tax return. Actually, that's not the case. When you're filing the return, you're simply going to have a number that's going to say, here are the improvements, right? If you get audited, then the government is going to want to know how you figured out that number. So your goal is going to be to have documentation that you feel is adequate in case you get audited, okay? So if you're, if you're selling and you simply bought the house and now you're selling it, uh, the price is purchase price plus improvements. If you bought the land, and this happens occasionally uh, in, in the Metro West area, a lot on the Cape and Islands, because a lot of people bought the land or inherited the land or got it gifted to them, then the, the basis is the cost of the land, what you paid for the land, plus the construction cost of your house, plus these improvements. What if somebody gave it to you? Or what if you inherited it? In that case, your basis is the basis of the person who gave it to you. Anytime that a person makes a gift of appreciated property, property that is now worth more than what their basis was, um, what they're giving, they're giving the, the basis. Um, they're not paying a tax at that time. I know in many countries, I know specifically, we've, I've been doing some work with a, in a case in Ireland where 
if you make a gift of appreciated property, at that time there is a tax that is owed on the difference between what you bought it for and the value of it when you're giving it away. Same thing is, same thing is true um, if, you, if, you, if um, you inherit property in Ireland. Um, that's not the case here. If somebody gives you something, um, that does not, there is no tax as a result of that, there is no uh, income tax as a result of that gift. There is also no gift tax, and we're going to talk about that a little later. But the main thing, there's no income tax. But the point is, you've just, in, you've, now you, that's your basis. So the question is, if your mother gave you the property that she inherited from her mother, right, then the basis was the value of the property at the time of the inheritance from her mother, for reasons that I'm going to go into, into a little bit later on. If, if your mother bought the property and is then giving it to you, your basis is whatever she bought it for. So, basis in that case, if you receive the property as a gift, is, um, the, 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 is the, the, the basis of the property uh, when it was given to you. Or excuse me, is the basis, is it, the basis of the property was either what the person who gave it to you bought it for or whatever their basis was because they had inherited it. And there are the capital gains costs. So, <clears throat> if you're Frank and Mary in Metro West, and you go to and say you're about to sell your house and say that you bought the house and remember in our example their house is worth four hundred thousand dollars say they their basis say they bought it um, but for whatever, whatever reason their basis in the property is a hundred thousand dollars Say they bought it for a hundred thousand dollars they sell it for four hundred thousand dollars their capital gains tax would be three or excuse me their capital gain would be three hundred thousand dollars normally they would pay a tax based on that 300,000. Remember we said that the capital gains tax is about 20% of the gain, therefore their tax would be $60,000. However, as you all know, uh, if you have been living in the property for some period of time, then you get a capital gains tax exclusion. That exclusion is $250,000 per person. So in the case of Frank and Mary, um, it, it, they would, you, would calc, you would say they, they bought for 100, they sold for 400, their capital gain was 300. Their, their exclusion is two times $250,000 if they've both been living there for a period of time. Uh, and therefore, their capital gains tax is zero. So the question then is, I just want to go back for a second, um, um, what, how do you qualify for the exclusion? So you qualify that's the rule. If you lived in the property for two of the last five years, it makes no difference if you've used the, an exclusion like this before. For many of you who are older, um, you'll remember, you'll have it in the back of your mind, that back when we were younger, there was a cap on this. You could only use this exclusion once. That's no longer the case. I literally had a family that had three properties. They, had a, they, they lived in Framingham, here in Metro West. They had a house on the Cape. And the husband had inherited a house in Ohio to which they were going to be moving um, because they had, a lot of the, they had a lot of family in Ohio, et cetera, right? So what they did was they sold the house in Framingham, which they had bought for a little and were selling for a lot, but they were able to take advantage of their exclusion, so they paid no capital gains tax. They moved to their house on the Cape. They lived there for two more years. Remember, you only have to have live, lived in it for two of the last five years. They lived in it for two years, then sold that property, which had appreciated a tremendous amount because it was a little cottage that they had bought years ago, paid no capital gains on that, took all their money and moved to Ohio. So, so you, you, once again, you want to talk to somebody about you know, what the implication of the capital gains tax is going to be for you. Now, if you're Frank and Mary, we went, th we went through the example. If you're Peg and you live in Metro West and you bought that same house for 100000 and you're selling it for four, your capital gain is three, her exclusion, though, she's single, is only $250,000. Therefore, the net capital gain is $50,000. The tax is 20% of that, or $10,000. Now, say you're Frank and Mary on the islands. You bought the house for $100,000, same house, but now it's worth a million. This is not an uncommon situation. On, on, on uh, Nantucket, th that number would be even greater uh, in many cases. But say it's worth a million. Your capital gain, therefore, is $900,000 minus the two exclusions, $250 apiece for $500,000, uh, means your capital gain is $400,000. So you're actually paying 
a capital gains tax of $80,000, 20% of that $40,000. Say you're PEG, you bought the house for $100,000, you're selling for a million, capital gain is $900, your exclusion is only $250, your capital, net capital gain is $650,000. Your tax is $130,000. This is the reason why if you're on the islands, you really don't want to be selling your property. So, so, and the reason for that is, if you hold on to your property until you die, at the moment of your death, your basis, your tax basis jumps to the date of death value. Jumps to the date of death value. So if Frank and Mary hold the property until they're both dead, the moment of the death of the second of the two of them to die, their basis jumps to the, to the, to the, uh, the current value, whatever that value is, uh, their children pay zero in capital gains tax. The implication of that, by the way, is that for most people, if you possibly can, you want to hold on to that property until you die so that you can get that capital gain step up. Uh, ideally, you want to either own the property when you die or if it's in trust, you want to make sure that that is a so-called grantor taxable trust. We won't go into the details about that. You want to talk to your accountant or your lawyer about that, but you want to make sure it's a, the kind of trust where you're still going to be able to get this exclusion. Or alternatively, that you want to keep the property and, uh, or you want to keep, you, you want, if you're transferring an interest in the property to your children, you want to keep a life estate in it. Uh, one, one, by the way, regarding this example, I want you to remember, if Frank and Mary own this property jointly and one of them dies, uh, so the other one becomes the sole owner, the basis of the person who died, that is half of the value of the property, would jump to that person's date of death value. If the survivors then sold the house, the survivor's basis would be that jump up, as, uh, that stepped up basis after 50% of the value and their original basis as to the other 50% of the value. The only way that you can avoid that is by making sure that the first spouse to die owns all of the house. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later. Um, so before we talk about the, the estate tax, uh, I wanna be clear on the gift tax because, because uh, you can avoid a lot of the estate tax by doing gifting but the, but the question that inevitably comes up when I talk about gifting is, well, isn't there a limit on the amount that I can give? And, and the answer is uh, really no, no. Not for any of the clients that I have ever dealt with, no. The reason for that is this. There is no Massachusetts gift tax. So you can literally give away all of your property the day before you die, thereby avoid the estate tax. Uh, and by the way, the receipt of a gift is not income. The receipt of a gift is not income. So your, your children, if you give away your property, don't, don't pay any income tax as a result of your giving them all the property. At the federal level, somebody figured out this problem that they don't want people to give away all of their property just before they die. And so they adopted a combined uh, estate and gift tax system. And the way that system works is that you, if you have an estate worth more than a particular number when you die, it's now $12,920,000, um, you pay an estate tax. If during your lifetime you've made a gift, you pay a gift tax, unless you're entitled to one of the two exclusions, the one that everybody knows about and the one that nobody knows about. The one that everybody knows about is that there's a given amount per person per year that you can give anybody you want. And that number used to be $10,000 but there was an inflation provision built into the law. So it is now actually for 2023, it's $16,000. Everybody knows that one. Then there's the other one that no one knows, which is in addition to that exclusion, you, you can give during your lifetime up to the estate tax exclusion, which is now $12,920,000. So unless that's what you're, you're giving over your lifetime, $12,920,000, there is no gift tax. One, one other thing related to the gift tax. Many people will say, oh, your accountant will tell you, somebody will tell you, oh, but if, you, if you've given away more than $16,000 in, in a year to a person, you have to file a gift tax return. Well, the next time somebody tells you that, <clears throat> ask them what happens if you don't. Because what happens is nothing. Because the only penalty for failure to file a gift tax return is a percentage of the tax that you would have paid. And unless over your lifetime you're giving away more than $12,920,000, there isn't a tax and therefore there's no percentage. So there's no penalty to fail, for failure to file the gift tax return, 
With that in mind, <clears throat> the question if you live in Massachusetts is given all of the capital gains rules, especially the ones that, that incentivize you to keep your property until you die, what, and that, and that's so that you can get that stepped up basis, what is the estate tax disadvantage of doing that? To know, understand that, you need to understand the Massachusetts estate tax. The Massachusetts estate tax, <clears throat> for historical reasons that I won't go through, gets calculated two different ways. Every time you have an estate, you calculate the tax, you figure out the tax using both, both of these ways, and then you pay the lower of the two taxes if you owe anything. The first way is that you look at this chart. According to the chart, which was created a long time ago, almost 100 years ago at this point, if you look at the chart, um, according to the chart, if you have an estate worth more than $40,000, you're going to pay a, a tax. It's a small tax, a very small percentage, um, and, but, and it's graduated, so, it, so the, the, the more money you have, the more tax you end up paying. According to that chart, if you had an estate of, for, of, for example, a million dollars, and I'll mention that because of the next slide, a million dollars, you would pay an estate tax of $36,560. <clears throat> if you had an estate like Frank and Mary in the Metro West of a million five, you'd pay an estate tax of 68,240. If you had an estate of $2,100,000, you'd pay an estate tax of $111,000. $600. That's quite a bit of money. <clears throat> so first you calculate the tax that way. Then you calculate the alternative tax. The alternative tax is that if you have an estate of less than a million dollars, you pay zero in estate tax. If you have an estate of more than a million dollars, you pay 40% of all the dollars over a million dollars. So for example, if you have an estate of a million dollars using the chart, you pay zero in tax or, or excuse me, using the alternative tax, you pay zero. Using the chart, you pay $36,560. You always have to, pay, have to pay the lower of the two numbers. In this case, it's zero. At 20, 000, if you have a million twenty thousand dollars in estate, you're, you're, according to the chart, you pay $37,680. According to the alternative, you're paying 20% of all the dollars over a million. So 20% of the, that $20,000 would be $8,000, or excuse me, 40% of that $20,000 would be $8,000. You pay the lower of the two, therefore you pay $8,000. Go down to a million, a, a million one. At a million one, uh, you're paying, you, you, according to the chart, you're paying 42,000 something. According to the alternative, you're paying 40. <clears throat> the, the change comes at a million, at a, little, a little under a million $120,000. At a million $120,000, according to the chart, you're paying $45,000, excuse me, you're paying $43,000 according to the alternate, according to the alternative tax, you're paying $48,000. From there on in, you always pay less tax calculating it using the chart. The, the lines cross, as I mentioned, at around, around $1,120,000. So the question is always, try, always trying to avoid probate, but also trying to figure out the balance between minimizing your estate tax and minimizing your capital gains tax. <clears throat> for families, for Frank and Mary, this is basically a two-step solution. First, you make sure that the first spouse to die owns the property, owns the property. The property can be transferred at the last minute as long as when the, survive, when the first spouse dies, the property isn't simply going back to the second spouse. If it's going right back to the second spouse and if the transfer has occurred within a year of death, then this doesn't work. But if it is, be, if it is being transferred not to directly back to the second spouse, but in trust for the benefit of the second spouse, the house can be transferred to the first spouse to die, literally the day before that person dies. When the person dies, the basis of the house jumps to the date of death value. The surviving spouse can then either give the property away to the kids with this stepped up basis, so that the kids, if they want to, can sell it and not pay any capital gains tax, or the surviving spouse can sell the house at the stepped up basis, not pay any capital gains tax, and then simply give away the money. So there is a clear way to deal with this. If you're Mary, un excuse me, if you're Peg, unfortunately, there is no way to escape that. I'm just going to mention one final thing, which is, all of this may be changing this year, and I'm going to do another presentation on this if it does change. The governor has proposed a budget in which the, the capital gains tax, or excuse me, the estate tax exclusion jumps 
to $3 million. If that were the case, in Frank and Mary's case, even on the islands, there'd be no estate tax. Last year, the two houses of the legislature had agreed on alternate bills that would have increased that, that exclusion, the exclusion to $2 million. That's why I think that in the ultimate budget this year, and we're going to know the answer to this probably in August, that, that threshold number is going to jump from a million to somewhere between $2 million and $3 million. If that's the case, then for Frank and Mary, the, and for PEG, the issue is going to, going to, go, uh, is going to go away because the, 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 the estate tax for Massachusetts purposes is going to evaporate. So the goal is always going to be make sure that you own the property or that your spouses, the first of the two of you to die, owns the property before you die so that the survivor can sell the property without paying any capital gains tax at all. Um, there were a few other issues that I was going to talk about today. Um, but I wanted to focus on the ones that we just talked about. Um, and if, if you get any questions on any of this, uh, please give me a call anytime. My direct line is 508-860-1470. But remember, the goal of this exercise is always peace of mind. The goal of life is, at our age is to sleep well at night. Um, thanks for watching. If you've got any questions, once again, please give me a call. Um, and I will look forward to talking to you next month. Thank you very much.